This one right here deals with patience, amen? amen. Patience, please. Yes, patience. patience. How many of us have, have, a, have a trouble with, with patience sometimes? <laughs> amen. Amen. You know, we're, we're the ones that we, we, want it, we want it right now, huh? We want it done now. Not tomorrow, not next week. We don't want to wait. One now, and we got to have patience, amen. We're going to go to uh, verses 7 through 12 in chapter 5. Amen. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient unto the Lord's coming. I like what it says there. Be patient, brethren, as you wait to the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits expectantly for the precious harvest from the land. See how he keeps up his patient vigil over it until it receives the early and the late rains. So you also must be patient. Establish your hearts. Strengthen and confirm them in the final certainty, for the coming of the Lord is very near. Do not complain, <laughs> brethren, <Amen>. sisterin, <laughs> against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Look, the judge is already standing at the very door. As an example of suffering and ill treatment together with patience, brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as his messengers. You know how we call those blessed happy who were steadfast, who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and you have seen the Lord's purpose and how he richly blessed him in the end. Inasmuch as the Lord is full of pity and compassion, or piety, what's that, pity or piety? Pity, pity. pity huh? Mm -hmm. Yep, and compassion and tenderness and mercy. But above all things, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be a simple yes and your no be a simple no, so that you may not sin and fall under condemnation amen. amen praise god verses seven through eight here you know james now turns to the believers who are being oppressed and encourages them to be patient you know that's a hard thing to to do you know and i, I don't care who it is you know what i mean like man when you're being persecuted it's it's hard to be patient, you know what I mean? It's it's kind of, it's hard to 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 bear and to to stand up when you feel like you got the weight coming down upon your shoulders, you know? The motive for patience is the coming of the Lord. And this may refer either to the rapture or to Christ's coming to reign. Both are used in the New Testament as an incentive to patient endurance. The farmer illustrates the need of patience in verse 7. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. And it says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, and it's patient with it until it receives the early and the latter rains. Rather, there is a long period of waiting. You know, he does not reap on the same day that he plants. First, there must come the early rain, causing the seed to germinate. Then at the end of the season is the later rain, needed to bring the crops to successful fruitation. Some see in this reference to early and later rain a promise that the blessing of Pentecost at the beginning of the church age will be repeated before the Lord's return. But the overall tenor of the New Testament scripture seems to discourage such and expectation. However, there is nothing to forbid or looking for a faithful remnant of believers on fire for God and bent on world evangelism. What better way to welcome the returning Savior? 
you know, about spreading the gospel, evangelizing, like I shared on, on Sunday morning, you know what I mean? Leading people to Christ, pointing people to God, you know, and not to people and not to all kinds of other things and not to religion, but to a relationship with our Lord and Savior. Why? Because he's the one that's going he's gonna, to he's the one that's gonna change them. He's the one that's going to set them free. He's the, he's the only way. He's the only way. He's the hope, the truth, and the light. We need him. You know, the wrongs of the earth will be made right when the Lord returns. Therefore, his people should be patient like the farmer. Their hearts should be established with the certainty of his coming. You know, in verse 8, he says, You also must be patient, strengthen your hearts, because the Lord's coming is near. Up in the Amplified, you know what I mean? Establishing. You know, that's that, that's, that's that relationship, you know what I mean, that, that you have. You know, it's not something that just happens overnight. You know, you don't just know everything about somebody right away. Just like most of us, you know, we, <laughs> we probably know more about people than we do about God. We probably understand people more than we understand God. And, you know, and it, it should be different. You know what I mean? It should be the other way around. And, and the reason why is because we spend more time with people than we do with God. Right. When we should really be spending more time with God. So that way when we're in contact with people, we're more of a help instead of a hindrance or a burden. Right. You know, we all like to tell people about how we feel. Or what's going on in, in our life and this and all that that's happening. But what about what God is doing in your life? See, we focus more on the problem than we do on the blessing. We focus more on all the, all the stuff that's, that, that's uncomfortable and that don't feel good. Instead of, you know what I mean, seeing God through it all and being like, man, Lord. You know, this is how good God is because, you know, he, He's bringing me through these things so that way, you know, He can change me. That way He can, he can, he can make me stronger. That way, you know what I mean, I, 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 can, I can be blessed in, in many areas of my life instead of always feeling down and out. Do not grumble in verse 9. It says, brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another. So that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Man, we sure do like to pick people apart, don't we? I don't like this and I don't like that. I don't like the smell of the Rose of Sharon. <laughs> huh? It's an example. See, I'm giving an example there, you know, but some, somebody else might like it. You know, and, that, and that's my opinion, you know what I mean? And, but I, I should learn how to, you know what I mean, this. So what? If I don't like it, then don't say nothing about it. You know what I mean? One person likes it, the next person don't. You know, and, and I see a lot of it, you know. That's why I don't like to go out to eat. Because when I go out to eat, I like to enjoy my food. But a lot of times when you go out to eat with a group of people, all you hear is complaining. Oh, I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I, I this, and that's like, oh, my Lord. We haven't even took a bite yet, and you've already ruined my whole meal. <laughs> you know, it's crazy, you know, or you go, you get into things, you know what I mean, where just, just for instance, you know what I mean, like you can go to somebody else's house. It's not even your house. And you're over there complaining about things that it's not even your house. They don't even belong to you. You don't even live there. No se importa. You just be quiet. Who cares? It ain't your house. You know what? Your house is your house. Don't complain about somebody else's house. Amen. Go to a store. Same thing. We complain about things at the store. It's not your store. <laughs> Man. You know, we, we have so many things, you know what I mean? Even, even our own personal stuff. We could buy a vehicle, you know what I mean? Because you needed a vehicle, but yet, you know what I mean? Instead of being happy that you have, you know, four full tires instead of four flats, 
Man, you complain about a noise or this or a button or this and that, and you're just like, man, when does it ever end? When do we ever feel satisfied? When are we ever happy, you know what I mean, with, with, with God supplying, you know what I mean, the very need that we need. It's all right there, and it's in abundance, but we complain about the abundance. Amen. You know, not everybody can have a new car. That's just the way life is and the way cars are right now. You know, they're getting more expensive and more expensive. You know what I mean? Man, it's getting so crazy. You know, just be happy that you got a car. That's right. Just be happy that you got Because there's a lot of people that I know out there that don't have a car. Yes. Go ride the bus for a while. You know, a lot of us, we got it so easy, you know what I mean? Because we live in Brighton. It's a smaller town. You know, most of us, you know what I mean, if you don't live, you know what I mean, if you live like, you know, you know, like 15, you know, miles away, you know, 20 miles away or your your job's far, you know, and you, you need a vehicle to, to get back and forth. But most of us that are here, you know what I mean, there's a lot of things that we do here in town that, you know, you don't need a car. You can walk. You can. You, you can walk. Really, you could. You could, you could walk. But you know what I mean, and most of us, we have vehicles. But yeah, we would complain if we would have to walk four blocks, five blocks. We would complain about it instead of be instead of being grateful. You know, and he, and he tells us here. You know what I mean? Don't grumble. You know, during times of persecution and distress, it is not uncommon for the victims to turn against one another. I mean, you know, that's that's the most common time is when when you feel like you're attacked. If you feel like you're attacked or you feel like, you know what I mean, like, like something's going on, it's always quick to, to say something. I had to learn. You know, one thing about being a, a preacher, you know what I mean, is something that, that I guess that a lot of people don't take into consideration. Everybody expects the preacher to be all perfect. Oh, well, he can't do this, or he can't do that, or he can't do... Well, what kind of preacher do you guys want? Or do they want? You know what I mean? Like, man, if you have a preacher that, you know what I mean, that you're looking to, like, as a God, like, if he don't do nothing, you know what I mean, that he's just perfect. You know, the only person I know that's perfect is, is Jesus. Amen. And if you have a preacher, you know what I mean, that that that... Always, you know, acts like he doesn't make any mistakes or he doesn't have any faults or that he's just perfect. You better be careful because that sounds like a wolf in sheep's clothing to me. That's true. Because every word that a minister is supposed to preach from behind the pulpit, he is either supposed to have to gone through it. He's either supposed to have to experience it or gone through it. And half of these preachers around the world... Don't go through nothing or try to hide the things that they're going through instead of being transparent with the people to say, hey, you know what? I go through the very same things that you go through, but don't judge me. Right away, everybody's ready to kick the preacher out or kick the teacher out or whoever it may be to kick them out instead of saying, you know what? I know you, you, you fall short of the glory of God. I know that you go through the same struggles and everything, so we're going to pray together. We're going to pray together and we're going to lift one another up. Lift one another up. You know, my, my wife shared it with me. It talks about it in the book of Leviticus, chapter 4. It also talks about it in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22. You know, he's that sacrifice for each and every single one of us. His blood was the price that was paid for all of us. You know what? Because we're not perfect. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. But when things do happen, we're supposed, to help, we're supposed to help each other out. We're supposed to build each other up. Yes. Amen. Instead of pointing the finger and grumbling and complaining about, I don't like this and I don't like that. You know, it's a curious twist of human nature that in times of pressure... We build up wrath against those we love most. You see this most common in, in, in children. Why is it that children always take it out of mama? 
They could be nice to the guy who, to the dad or to the person who does them, does them the most harm. But man, the one that they get the maddest at and the one that does everything for them, that's the one that they get mad at. They get mad at the mama all the time. And the mama's the one that does, you know, nighttime does everything for them. And they get mad and, or, you know, it could be the other way around. Maybe it's the dad that does everything for them. And who do they get mad at? The one that does everything for them. You know what? The one that loves them the most, that's the one that they want to point the finger at. That's the one that they want to bash and put down and do all. Because like, man, what did I do to you? But love you. And see, and it's human nature when, when we get like that. You know, hence the warning, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. The word grumble here does not mean to allow reluctantly, but rather to have an inward resentment that are unexpressed. This verse has a voice for servants of the Lord working together under trying circumstances. We should not let resentment build up. After all, the judge is already out the door. He knows what we think. Soon we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account. We should not judge, least we be judged. Amen. You know, that's the last thing I want on my, on my mind. That's the last thing I want on my plate. You know what I mean? Being saved and then go, I, I want to go up there and I, I want to I worship God for eternity. I don't want to go up there and, well, it's time for judgment. That's hardcore. You know, verses 10 through 11. It says, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. The Old Testament prophets are brought forth as examples of sufferings and patience. Note that suffering precedes patient. Tribulation precedes perseverance. Let's go to Romans 5.3. Moreover, let us also be full of joy now. Let us exalt and triumph in our troubles and rejoice in our sufferings knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship produce patient and unwavering endurance you got to go through it you got to go through it it's something that that we need church that we have to go through you know troubles produce endurance as explained previously, patient in the New Testament means fortitude or steadfastness because of their faithfulness in declaring the word of the Lord. The prophets were persecuted unmercifully, yet they endured as seeing him who is invisible. Hebrews eleven twenty seven. Motivated by faith, he left Egypt behind him, being unawed and undismayed by the wrath of the king, for he never flinched, but held staunchly to his purpose and endured steadfastly as one who gazed on him who is invisible. Man, how many of us are worry warts in here? Man, we worry about everything, right? Man, we worry, 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 worry about bills, worry about food, worry about, we worry about a lot of things, right? We worry, worry about health, worry about, you know, our children, man, worry about this, worry about that. We worry, worry, worry when we're not supposed to be worried, you know, when we're supposed to be looking at the Lord, knowing that he has it under control. You know what, gazing upon him and just going, man, I'm going, Lord, I know you got it under control. Amen. Who looked back and turned into a pillar of salt? 
Lot's wife. He told them what to do. He said, don't look back. Whatever you do, don't look back. It's like a representation of worrying. You know what? She was looking back. She was already worried. And she looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Just like most of us, you know, that's, that's what happens to us. We, we become frozen in life. When you look back and you worry on things, what happens is it, it stuns you. You know what? You're in, you're in a motion like this, man, with the Lord moving with God, and you're going this way. And then every time you look back, what it's like, it just freezes you. You just stop. You know what I mean? Instead of, you know, going forward, you, you're stuck in a place where you shouldn't be. And that's something that, that we don't want to do. I want you to go with me to Hebrews 11, verses 32 through 40. He says, And what shall I say further? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. Who by the help of faith subdued kingdoms, Administer justice, obtain promise, blessing, close the mouth of lions, extinguish the power of raging fire, escape the devourings of the sword, out of frailty and weakness, want strength, and became stalwart, even mighty, and uh, res resistless in battle. Man, let's keep going all the way to 40. Routing alien hosts. Some women received against their dead by a resurrection. Others were tortured to death with clubs, refusing to accept release offered on the terms of denying their faith so that they might be resurrected to a better life. Others had to suffer the trial of mocking and scourging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were lured with tempting offers to renounce their faith. They were sawn asunder. They were slaughtered by the sword while they were alive. They had to go about wrapped in the skins of sheep and goats, utterly destitute, oppressed, cruel, treated. Men of whom the world was not worthy, roaming over the desolate places and the mountains and living in caves and caverns and holes of the earth. And all of those through they won divine approval by means of their faith did not receive the fulfillment of what was promised. Because God had us in mind and had something better and greater in view for us so that they, these heroes, were heroines of faith, should not come to perfection apart from us before we could join them. What does the Bible say that, you know what I mean, when he comes, he says that we're going to meet him in the sky, right? So how come is it that most of us, you know what I mean, like, man, I don't know, most Christians, they think that serving the Lord is, you know, about prosperity. It's all about, you know what I mean, not going through bad times or nothing like that, that it's just all good. That's, that's the gospel that I hear being preached. To 90% of the people that, that I talk to that are calling themselves Christians, that's the way that they believe. They believe that, you know what I mean, that it's all supposed to be good. That there's not supposed to be any problems, you know what I mean? It's, it's that, that love gospel. And yes, I know God is love, but you know what I mean? Like, man, like, it's, it's different. You know, these people were hiding in caverns. They were being persecuted and all the stuff that they were going through. You know, it wasn't an easy road. It wasn't an easy walk because of what they believed in. But they endured through it all. See, the reason why people don't want that kind of faith is because, you know what, they don't want to endure through that type of stuff. Because it's difficult for any of us, right? Amen. Well, we don't want to go through hard times, right? Amen. That's why we need to be born again. <laughs> That's why we got to have the Holy Spirit inside of us, the comforter, the counselor, the one who gives us, you know, hope and rest and reassurance. That's why it's so important to be born again. That's why it's so important to know the truth, because the truth will set you free. 
See, we look back upon prophets such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel with a great deal of respect. And what about Daniel in the lion's den? How many of us would have been able to go through that? Imagine that. He didn't even complain, man. He went, just put me in there. Go ahead. I hope they're hungry. He didn't say, oh, I hope they're starving. Or I hope they're already full because I don't want them to eat me. Nah. He said, you're going to put me in there, put me in. Whatever you're going to do to me, do it. But you know what? I ain't ever going to stop praising God. No matter what you do to me, I ain't going to stop praising God. So how many of, you know, the people that we know or that, you know, just watching on TV or heard about, you know what I mean? They want everybody to praise them. They want everybody to praise them. You know, I just want to praise God. That's what I want. I want God to get all the glory. He gets all the glory in everything. You know what? Man, thank you, Lord. Thank you for trials. Thank you for tribulation. Thank you for persecution, Lord. You know, and people looked at them with a great deal of respect. Now it's opposite. People see you going through trials and tribulations now, and what do they say? Oh, he must be sinning. Huh? He's got secret sin. He's has something to hide. That's why he's going through what he's going through, man. Why? Because the Lord's punishing him. Huh? That's, right. that's what they say, right? Yeah. Come on, church. That's what they say, right? Yes. Oh, they'll look at a church like ours, right? And it's all, it, there's not too many people in here. And they'll look and they'll be like, oh, well, the Lord's not there, man. The Lord's punishing them. I laugh at that. You know what? I say, thank you, Jesus. Because the Lord showed me something different in it. He gave me the book of Acts chapter 2 and the birth of a church. And when he says, you know what? I will draw the people. Not man, not nobody else, but I will draw the people. And those that I draw are going to stay. Those because I have called them to me. Not to me, but to me. To him. They're his people. God builds the church. Not a fundraiser. God builds the church, not all kinds of games and gimmicks. God builds the church, especially through persecution. How can a church ever be able to want to stand and be a church if they never go through nothing? You can have all kinds of churches that you want that are, you know, financed and whatever, and you got all the money, but as soon as, you know what I mean, all that money's gone, I bet you that church don't stand. I bet you they pack up and go somewhere else or do something different and say, hey, you know what? We're going to keep doing what God called us to do. That's just like Daniel and them. They didn't, they didn't change. They kept going for the Lord. You know, we agree that we're right and the world was wrong. Well, we should remember that they went through the great trials and sufferings and that they endured with patience. If we want to be blessed, it is only reasonable to conclude that we will be called upon to do the same. If we want to be blessed, it, it, you're going to go through trials. You're going to go through persecution. You're going to go through, through hard times. But are you going to stand in it? Are you going to stand, you know what I mean? Because God has a blessing for you. God wants to bless you. God wants to do something mighty in your life. Job is a fine example of endurance and fortitude. Few, if any men in the history of the world have ever suffered so much loss and so short of a time as Job. Yet he never cursed God or turned from him. In the end, he endured. He was rewarded. God revealed himself and he always, as he always does, to be merciful and full of pity. God always shows up on time. But will we wait for him? Will we endure? That's the hardest thing is being patient in tribulation. The hardest thing is being patient in hard times when everything around you is telling you to give up. 
Everything around you and everything in you is telling you to throw the towel in. It's, it's done. It's finished. But instead of trusting in God and saying, no, God, I won't quit. No, God, I won't give up no matter how hard it hurts, no matter how bad it is, Lord God, no matter what it looks like, no matter what they say, I'm going to hold on because I know, Lord, that you're going to bless me. Amen. You're going to bless me. And how do I know that to be true? Because it's all throughout the Bible. Man, there's so many accounts of those men who stood that God blessed. He blessed them. Because they didn't give up. Amen. You know, if we did not know what James calls the end intended by the Lord, that is the final issue or result which the Lord brings to pass, we might be tempted to envy the wicked. Asaph was jealous when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. Let's go to Psalms 73. Verses 3 through 17. For I was envious of the foolish and arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they suffered no violent pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they smitten in plague like other men. Therefore, pride is about their necks like a chain. Violence covers them like a garment, like a long, luxurious robe. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish, and the imaginations of their minds overflow with follies. They scoff and wickedly utter oppressions. They speak lawfully from on high, maliciously and blasphemous. They set their mouths against and speak down from heaven, and their tongues swagger through the earth, invading even heaven with blasphemy and smearing earth with slanders. Therefore his people return here, and waters of a full cup offered by the wicked are blindly drained by them. Are they, and they say, how does God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who always prosper and are at ease in the world. They increase in riches. Surely then in vain have I cleansed my heart and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been smitten and plagued and chastened in every morning. I, had I spoken thus and given expression to my feelings, I would have been untrue and have dwelt treacherously against the generation of your children. But when I consider how to understand this, it was too great an effort for me to, too painful. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood, for I considered their end. See, the more he thought about it, the more he protruded he became. Then he went into the sanctuary of God and understood their later end. This dispelled all his envy. David had the same experience in Psalm 17, 14. He describes the portion of the ungodly in this life. Then in the next verse, contrast the portion of the believers in the life to come. In view of this, it pays the believer to be steadfast in Job's case. God gave him twice as much as he had before. Twice as much as he had before. And don't swear. And in verse 12, it says, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no, so that you won't fall under judgment. In patience, in times of trials, is also manifested in swearing. Here it is not a question of profanity or cursing primarily. Neither is it a matter of talk, taking an oath in a court of law. The practice forbidden in the thoughtless use of the Lord's name or some other name to attest the truthfulness of one's speech. The Christian should not have to swear by anyone or anything either in heaven or on earth. Those who know him should be able to depend on the fact that his yes means yes and his no means no. That's it. How many of us know Christian, man? We don't, 
We don't know where they're going or coming. You just got to be straight up with people, church. You know what? You got to live your life for the Lord, you know what? So that way people, they know you. They just already know you. So I'm not going to ask him. Why? Because I already know he's going to say no. Huh? Because they already know what kind of person you are. And I'm not saying it in a bad way, you know what I mean? Like, I'm talking about in other things. You know what I mean? Like, man, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna invite him over here because these people are drinking and doing all this other stuff. So I already know he's just gonna say no. So I'm, I'm just not even gonna ask him, because they already know who you are. But instead of falling into it, you know, they'll, they'll ask you all day long. Oh, come on, why? Because they know you play games. They know the kind of people that, that, that people hang around with. They know how you talk and the things and the conversations you get into and, and, and the way that you live your life. So guess what? It's open season for most people. They invite you to places that what you don't have no business going to. Instead of them saying, no, I know he's too Christian. I have a guy that lives down the street from me. He does hip-hop music, hip-hop Christian music. And the first thing he tells me, he comes up and he goes, man, he goes, do you mind if we do a video in front of your car? He said, man, he goes, I heard you're a hardcore Christian. <laughs> he already knows what's up, you know what I mean? It's like, I didn't even know this guy. I've never even talked to him. I never even had a conversation with him or nothing. He lives like three houses down the block. And I don't know who he heard it from, but he heard it. He said, man, I heard you're a hardcore Christian. I didn't have to tell him. They just know. Does your family know that about you? Do your friends know that about you? Do people that you talk to, do they know that about you? That, that you're a hardcore Christian? That you know what? You, you, you live for Jesus. You stand for the Lord. You, you, ain't, you, know, you ain't playing no games. Or do they know that you're wishy-washy and that you could be compromised? That your yeses be yes and that your noes be noes. You know, of course, this passage could be applied to forbid such needless expressions as for heaven's sake, as God is my judge, by, by, by Jehovah, and since mind's oath and G, constructions or contractions for Jesus, gosh, or golly, or the slang for God, least you fall into judgment, says James, perhaps thinking of the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. In Exodus 20, verse 7. You know, and this falls down in, in, in everything, church. I told you about the Christian cuss words. I know I'm guilty of it. I don't know about you. But you know what? I, and I've, I've said a lot of things that, you know what I mean, that, that I shouldn't have, you know, that I shouldn't say. You know, we know, what, we know what, what freaking means. It's just another word for something else. We know what shoot means. It's just another word for something else. You know, there's all kinds of other words that, that we say, you know what I mean, that isn't, you know what I mean, a uh, 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 cuss word in Webster's Dictionary, wherever you may have it, but it's still, we know, what, we know what it means. And instead of, you know, changing that, instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to, to change that in our lives, we have become accustomed to doing those things. Letting our, you know, instead of letting our yeses be yes and our noes be no. Being patient, waiting for your time. You know, a lot of times we want to rush it. Man. I don't know why everybody's so eager to, to rush to, you know what I mean? Like, man, that's one thing to, to do something in ministry. But, man, so many people, they want to rush it. Like, if it's just, you know what I mean? Like, man, it's got to be done. We got to do it. We No. You know what? Wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait for God to open the door. Wait for God to prepare your heart to get you ready. Man, because I'm telling you, church. Man, it's tough. When you have to deal with, 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 with souls, when you got to deal with people, 
You know, when you're going to go home and just, you know, just live your life and do what you got to do, you know what I mean? But when you have to deal with people on a, on a 24-hour basis, man, it gets tough because it, it hurts. Why? Because you got to put yourself in other people's shoes, you know what I mean? And the things that they're going through, you know what I mean? Like, you, you take it on, and it's like, man... And it's a lot to take on, you know, and a lot of people, they're not ready for that. They're not ready for that. You know, and you got to let your yeses be yes, and you got to let your noes be no. It's time to, to take a stand for God. I'm not saying be, you know, I'm not saying be ignorant. I'm not saying be rude and, and all kinds of, you know, be loving. Be loving and filled with the Spirit of God, you know what I mean? But just be honest with people. Just be honest with people. See, you know, I, I don't do that no more. That's not my life, you know. I, I don't do that anymore. You know, and, and I still, you know, I still love you and whatever, but I would appreciate it, you know what I mean, if, you know, just, just don't even include me on that stuff. You know what I mean? You guys do what you want to do. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And that's it. You know, this is what I do. I, I, I serve God. I live for God now. Oh, well, you don't care. Yeah, I do care for you. That's why I'm praying for you. That's why I'm praying for you. Nobody else is praying for you. So I might as well pray for you. But be honest with your brothers and sisters too. You know what I mean? If you get offended, let them know. Let them know that you're offended. Why? Because that's the same thing I'm telling you in the book of Leviticus. Go read the book of Leviticus chapter 4. When you get offended with a brother and sister in Christ, you know what? Don't let it linger for, you know, for whoever knows how long. But you know what? Right away, bring it up to them. Bring up that offense and, and repent of it. Bring an offering before the Lord, not only for just yourself, but for the whole congregation. And move forward and lift one another up. And see, and that's what we got to do, church. If God is for us, who can be against us? We're going to come up here and pray tonight. And I just want to tell you, God bless you. We love you. Amen. Hallelujah.